Um, as, as always, I'm always honored to have this opportunity to speak God's word. When we were uh, worshiping, you know, I already had some scriptures and stuff that uh, I had uh, already laid out and kind of a little format and stuff. But for some reason, as we were singing that last song, and Sherry, thank you for, for doing that. I actually might have you come back and finish us up that night with that, that last song. Jesus told Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. She, he told her that right before he raised Lazarus from the grave. He told me to say that when we were worshiping. Tonight we're going to talk about Jesus. We're going to talk about the last time from the time that he was arrested and crucified. The title of the sermon was actually the final countdown. But uh, after talking with Pastor and a few other little things, whatever else, I was able to retitle it. Um, <coughs> A couple years ago, Heather and I uh, were sitting at home watching a couple of Gaither DVDs that we had bought. And uh, this is kind of how this came about. And uh, one of the songs that came across was uh, I've Just Seen Jesus. Larnell Harris and Sandy, Sandy Patty. I've heard other people sing this song, but those two are the only ones that I've heard that can actually pull that song. While we're sitting here watching the videos and all that stuff, you know, she was sitting next to me and whatever else. We had a quiet evening. We already had dinner and we just kind of winding out for the night. And all of a sudden, the Lord just spoke to me on my couch, as part of my couch. And this came about. Some of you have this. I shared this with Pastor a couple years ago. And I was waiting to see whenever this is going to come about. And I called it the Agony Unto Victory. And that's what this is going to be called. So I'll just kind of share this with you here real quick. Uh, it says, With the thorns in my brow, I thought of you. With the nails in my feet and hands, I called your name. As I shed my blood, I saved you. As, I, as my blood fell on the earth, I ransomed you from death. As I hung from the cross, I delivered you from the evil of the world. As I gasped for breath, I breathed a refreshing wind into your lungs. When my heart took its last beat, I introduced you to the Father. When I rose from the tomb, I broke every chain of sinful bondage. For you are my child. I took you from your deathly place on the cross. I took your pain, your suffering. I took your fear, your worries, and cast them away, never to be thought of again. I have made you whole. You are no longer broken. For I, Jesus, have taken you unto me. You are mine, and I am yours. Amen. That came to me just in one night. And I've had a couple other different um, uh, times I wrote out a few things. So, but as Pastor mentioned, uh, last year I finished up my first year of uh, uh, ASIM. It's a uh, uh, Arizona's District School of Ministry, but they dropped the D and just called ASIM. Uh, internship and uh, all that stuff. And I was, some of you know, Pastor had announced it a few weeks ago, that um, I had my credentialing interview on the 23rd of September, and I got the official letter on the 30th of September that they have passed me with flying colors, and I am now a credential minister with the Assemblies of God. I'm still waiting on the final you know, um, uh, final rubber stamp, as Pastor has called it. Uh, the, the packet gets sent to the general office in, in Missouri, and um, they, they do all the finalization on it, and then I'll get a, an initial, another official letter from them, and then I'll go to a district meeting, and they'll hand me the certificate or the card or anything like that. If any of you have been part of this on my journey, pray to help me with school, um, anything. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. The journey's not over yet. I still have seven more classes to go, and I'm working on the internship for this year. And if you happen to start seeing me hobble around the church a little bit, Pastor has agreed to also internship me to be the mentor again this year. He had me walk across a couple hot coals last year. So he's probably going to have me do that again this year. So if you see me hobble around this year, you're probably going to Okay. You got your Bibles. Oh, Lord, thank you for this opportunity. I'm a vessel at your disposal. I put self aside. Speak through me to your, to, your, to your children. Whatever it is that you want them to hear, let them hear it. In Jesus' name. Okay, Matthew 26, 36 through 46. 
you know, jump back and forth here a little bit. I lost some of my Bible tabs. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened to them. I actually had it all kind of tapped out, and some of them might have fell, fell, fallen in my backpack. I'm going to read some of this for you here. Okay, 2636. When Jesus was with his disciples, he called in a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he became sorrow and trouble. But he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And going a little farther, he held, he fell to his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as your will. Then he returned to the disciples and found them sleeping. Could you not watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter, Watch and pray so that sorry. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, Father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back again, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy, so he left them and went away and once more prayed third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping, resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of the sinners. Rise and let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Obviously, we already know who the betrayer is. The Judas Iscariot was the one that actually betrayed Jesus. So has anybody ever actually been overwhelmed to the point of death? I have. I've been overwhelmed, but not to the point of death. I mean, Jesus is actually starting to feel the weight of the world put on his shoulders from God at this time. He was so overwhelmed to the point that Luke 22, 44 actually talks about that he was so stressed for this, this thing that he was getting ready to um, deal with that he sweated blood. I've been outside, I work outside, I sweat a lot in the summertime when it's 115 plus degrees outside, but when I look down, I don't see blood. I just see sweat. So, I mean, that gives you an idea of what he was facing and how stressed he was. I've had a stressful few days, um, but not to the point where I'm actually going to start sweating blood uh, or even be so overwhelmed that I'm going to die. Um, it was about this, at this particular time, as I mentioned, that this is where God started putting the weight of the world on his shoulders. Um, verse 39, uh, see, when, Jesus, when Jesus began to pray, Lord, let this cup possibly be taken from me, yet my will be yours, or yet not my will, but yours be done. It was at this time Jesus began to realize what he was going to be facing. I'm sure that he, he knew he was going to be facing what he, you know his, his destiny at some point, but at this time is when he started realizing, I'm going to die. Um, verse 40. When Jesus returned, he found his disciples sleeping. He was upset and woke them up. And, and, and as far as my notes, he said, ask could you not watch and pray with me one hour. During this time, uh, and before, Satan tempted Jesus as well as his disciples to try to distract him. We all know that when Jesus was, you know, as far as was baptized, and he went off and wandered, you know, for 40 days and 40 nights, Satan came after him and started tempting him. And he fought the devil with the quote of scripture. At this time, I can really imagine that with Jesus being so overwhelmed and fleshly weak that he was really trying to come after him because a lot of times when we're tired, we're weak. And that's when the enemy starts coming after us because he knows our defenses are down. I know for a fact that there's times when I'm tired from either a long day of work or trying to work all day and then come to school, come home and try to, to, to study to get ready for one of the classes and all that stuff as far as, you know, I'm so exhausted. And there's times I'll come in here on Sunday mornings where I was up until 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning and slept and they came here to be here, you know, for a Sunday morning, a pastor needed to be here at an early time or anything like that. Walk in here literally with one eye open and one eye closed. And I can, I can kind of tell when the enemy starts coming after me a little bit is when I'm tired. But God also comes after you when you're tired too because then your defenses are down. You know, when he comes, when he tries to bless you for anything, 
you're, when you're when you're awake and all that stuff, you kind of tend to fight him a little bit at some point. But when your defenses are down, that's when he comes in. And he knows that you're weak and he can work through you. Um, also, as far as this, we look in here, this is where you know Jesus tells his disciples, "Could you not watch and pray with me for one hour?" They succumb to temptation to fall asleep. It shows here how frail we are as human beings that no matter how prayed up we are, how much scripture we have, that we can still fail. We can still fall. It doesn't matter who you are. You can have this book memorized from cover to cover, word for word, and still quote scripture like Jesus did. And even when the enemy comes at you, still quote scriptures, you can still fail. You can still fall. And it shows as far as, as he mentioned, as far as, you know, the, the flesh is willing, and the spirit is weak, because they gave in to their fleshly desires. And at that time is when Satan really started coming after him. It started to try to get to distract Jesus from doing what he was meant to do. In verse 42, he went away the second time and prayed, My father, if it not possible for this cup to be taken away from me, unless I drink it, may your will be done. This is the key verse to this whole thing. At this time, right here, at this verse, Jesus said, okay, Father, I accept what you have for me. He stood tall and said, okay, I am destined to die for your people. I am destined to be their Savior. Let's do this. This verse right here is where he, he decides to take and say, okay, well, if, you know, we're supposed to do the will of God. God calls us to do his will whatever it is. Um, I passed out a few things on a few tables and stuff. Um, it's, a, it's a visionary, it's a vision statement for uh, something that I feel God's leading me to do, um, to work with some troubled youth, start some type of a program. That's what I feel that God's will, his will for me to do. Um, feel free to, I, I was only able to make a few copies and I put them on a few tables and stuff, feel free to look at them. If you want to keep them, feel free, I got them on the computer. <laughs> Um, yeah, but for, verse 42, it basically says, unless I drink it, may your will be done. God's will. Period. That's what we're supposed to do. And then we go to verse 43, 44, or 45. Um, again, you know, he comes back and the disciples are sleeping and, and all that stuff and then he gets arrested. So, but you ask me, why is this important? Go ahead. Anybody, anybody want to ask me? I didn't get this from John on Sunday, Pastor. I actually had this on Saturday when, when we were over Pete and Sharon's. If you want to ask me, go ahead. I don't care. So, but I'll ask myself. Why is this so important to us? It says, during all of this, Jesus was fulfilling what God had planned to bring us back into relation with him. It was at this time, this time, where our lives began. Because when Jesus stood up and said, okay, Father, this is it. I'm ready. This is for your children. Let's do this. This time, this verse is when our lives began. We were on his mind 2,000 plus years ago. Period. He knew we were going to be standing here tonight, sitting here tonight, worshiping and all that stuff. He knows what we're going to be doing tomorrow. On Sunday, he knows we're going to be. We were on his mind at this particular time. I want to just kind of skip a few verses to Matthew 26, 62 through 64. Um, I said, I'm sorry, I, said I lost some of my, my tabs. Uh, so this shows as far as that um, Jesus actually was before... Um, Caiaphas and all the other, you know, as far as teachers, as far as the law and all that stuff. He was making a name for himself, but not a name that he really would want to have. I know I wouldn't want to have a name this way. I, I keep, I try to keep my name off to the side. Um, but it was this time, he said, as far as that he decided to start making a name for himself, as far as to show that uh, he was bad news. He was stirring the kettle. The Pharisees, the teachers. Everybody did not like that he was preaching. 
what he was preaching. You know, they kept calling him as far as that he was a blasphemer, that he was devil filled, he was demon filled. All the miracles that he did, he did because he was, you know, filled with demons and, and all this other stuff. But he knew that he had to do something to prove who he was at some point, and then also fulfill the plan of the Father by being crucified. And be crucified, not be stoned to death. Because back then you either died, I guess, one or two ways, either you were crucified or you were stoned to death. There was a reason why he needed to be crucified, not stoned to death. Um, and after, uh, after he went before Caiaphas and the other teachers and stuff, they brought him before Pilate. We'll go to John 18, 33 and 34. Okay, we'll just start here at 33. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus' response is, Is that your own idea? Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Pilate wanted to know who he was. He didn't want to know what other people thought about him or who he was. Pilate wanted to know who he was. Because even Pilate was trying to figure out who he was and see as far as if he was going to be you know, putting him to death or how he was going to be as far as putting him to death. So I put down here, so during the conversation, Jesus with Pilate, he began to talk about the kingdom, our kingdom that we're going to get to go to, um, with whoever believes in Jesus and live for him and also believes the truth of God that we'll get to go. Pilate instead decided to punish Jesus as opposed to putting him to death. That was his decision. He ordered Jesus to be beaten uh, back in 19, John 19.1 as Jesus was being beaten each and every whip was bringing us closer to God. Isaiah 53.5, he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. That wasn't back then. That's now, and tomorrow, and Friday, and Saturday, and Sunday, and Monday, and Tuesday. He was bruised for us. Our iniquities he took upon himself. Yeah, I had somebody give me a list of um, uh, all the different uh, meanings for iniquities. And it's a pretty long list. I didn't have enough time or, or page to put this on here. Uh, but some of it talked about wickedness. You know, pride can fall into that. Depending on, you know, pride, you know, whatnot. Um, I am proud to be a follower of Christ. You can be prideful in that. Uh, but pride means, you know, I'm prideful in myself and what I do. But this, this actually stood out at this time as far as the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And we can call on him anytime that we want. We need healing, and it doesn't matter if it's physical healing, emotional healing, financial healing, any type of healing we need, we can call on him. John 19, 4 through 11. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out. Do you let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him? When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate then said to them, Here is the man. He was trying to get him off, really. You know, here's the man. Here's what you guys wanted, to, wanted me to do. You know, I decided to, to beat him as opposed to crucifying him to try to shut the crowd up. The crowd wanted them to be crucified. Pilate didn't find any fault in him, so instead he tried to appease the crowd by having them beat. So when he said, here's the man, here's the example that you caused me to do, but the crowd decided they wanted something else. They wanted him to be crucified. Uh, let's see, John 19, 5. Okay, I'm sorry. I said, I... My tabs are gone. And I... Okay, yeah, so the crowd began to crucify, to crucify him. Pilate took Jesus back into the temple and asked him 
just who he really was. Jesus didn't say anything. He said, Pilate says, I am sure that he was a little irate when he stated this. He says, do you know that I have the power to set you free or crucify you? Or crucify you? And Jesus responds, you would have no power over me unless that was given to you from above. Yeah. In other words, he was saying, God allowed me to be here with you at this time. Not the people that delivered you or delivered me to you. God was the one that allowed me to be here. You have no other power that has given to me or to you from anybody except for what God has allowed. And this is, of course, you know, something that I'm sure that really got the you know, pilot kind of going a little bit. It's kind of like me telling Heather where her place is. And can you say smack? <laughs> Seriously, if I took and said something like that to Heather or whatever else, I'd probably be <laughs> picking up 32 teeth off the floor. But after that, it says, at, at this point is when our spirits really become alive and not to live in fear of the unknown. We're going to go to one of two places. We're going to go to heaven we're going to go to hell. Heaven, we already know what it's going to be like. It's glorious. I mean, the streets are made out of gold. The walls are made out of pearl, jasper. The, the, just the beauty of Jesus is going to be so radiant that we don't even need the sun. When you go to hell, you really don't know what's going to happen. You're going to be tormented. You're going to be poor. God only knows. At this point, we can become alive and not fear where we're going. And we go to John 19, 16 through 18, the crucifixion. Uh, so the soldiers took charge of Jesus carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. They crucified him and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Jesus is the only way to God. He's the only way to our salvation. If you look at this as far as how they put them, how the scriptures put, he was in the middle. He had a thief here, he had a thief here. There's a scripture back in Matthew that talks about how wide the gate, the wide, how the wide the gate leads to path of destruction, and the narrow path leads to righteousness. I'm sorry, I just can't, you know, think of that right off my head. Um, but when you, the pathway to righteousness is right between those two things. I had a vision in church one time where I was walking a tightrope, an invisible tightrope, and I had a a ghostly image in front of me it was during a worship service um, and it looked like that it was like a cross in front of me as long as I kept looking straight ahead I wasn't gonna fall but as soon as I turned my head to the left or right I started losing my balance and then when I looked back at the as far as that, that image again I started walking straight and that kind of resonated with me a little bit thinking as far as okay well that scripture is true when you look at it you know the one thief is here, the other thief is here, and Jesus is right in the middle. I don't think that there was a reason for that, but when it says as far as if Jesus was in the middle, he is the way. And yes, it is a straight and narrow path, but keeping your confidence in God, keeping your eyes on Christ, that path will be easy to walk. Now, this as far as um, this is going to be something really, really hard for Jesus to endure. Even through the beating with the whips, were very difficult to endure. This is going to be far worse than anything. As you can see here, the soldiers made Jesus carry his own cross to Golgotha. Partway, a man named Simon helped Jesus carry the cross, which Jesus couldn't handle it anymore. I call this the rock, of the, yeah, the rock, the walk of redemption. Here is when Jesus to work. As he's walking, dripping blood on the ground, saying, I love you. This blood's for you. I love you. 
this blood's for you. I love you. This blood's for you. Jesus did not solely die on the cross. He died for you. Every drop of his blood was shed for you. Every step, every humiliation, every strike, every whip, every mocking, every pierced nail, you were on his mind. When Jesus looked up at the, cross, up at the sky and said, it is finished, the agony has now become victory. Our victory. Our victory from death. Our victory from the cross that we were supposed to endure. He made us victorious by taking our place, going through all the agony, all the beating, all the nails, all the mocking, all whatever else as far as that he went through. He went through it because he loved us. He was there to become our, as far as uh, um, our lifeline. He became sin for us. And I, I taught a discipleship class not too long ago. And one of the questions I asked as far as whatever is, uh, or one of the phrases you know, I had mentioned is like, there's nothing in this world that you can go through that will ever compare to what Jesus went through when he died for you on the cross. I mean, I've stepped on nails. I've had pricks on my fingers. They don't feel good. But we're talking a nail that was inches long and probably about three inches you know, as far as thick. I don't know what those nails look like. I've seen a couple of them that um, somebody I think had found or whatever on TV, and that thing was was pretty long and pretty thick. Going through his hands, his feet, and just blood going everywhere. I mean, I kind of cried when I pricked my finger over there. <laughs> but he did it for you. He did it for us. He was the one that took it upon himself to rescue us and bring us back to the Father. So now Jesus has become our hope, our joy, our peace, our love, our strength, our victory. And most of all, he's become our Savior. Amen. Amen. I'm going to close here. This was just a short little deal. Um, and I apologize for the back and forth. Like I said, I did lose some of my tabs. We have become one with him. The chain that sin has broke is now mended. Jerry, can you come up, please? You can see that everything that Jesus did was to fulfill the plan that God had already laid out. Jesus knew he was going to be the one to save the lost man. Luke 19.10 We now have the direct relationship to God through Jesus Christ. And the last verses that um, I'm going to end with, everybody knows them. John 3.16-17 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever should believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent his son not into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. We're going to worship for a little bit more, uh, probably for about another five minutes. And feel free, just close your eyes, listen to the words, lift your hands, pray anything that you need to do. I wanted to kind of go this, do this kind of quick, because that way we can leave here tonight peacefully one and only person on our minds as we go home is Jesus.